All right, hey everybody, welcome back to Smirking Gun Reviews. This is Rob, and we're back finally after kind of an extended break here um, with more Patriot Season 2. We're doing Episode 3. It's called The Guns of Paris. So full spoilers if you haven't seen the episode. And another, just another great episode. It was only like 40 minutes long, and it was really jam-packed with stuff. Um, I want to thank one of my commenters uh, talking about this being a show kind of like the Coen Brothers, like the best thing the Coen Brothers haven't done or, you know, have done, and it's not a Coen Brothers thing. I really, I, that's a really good way of putting this show. Um, if the Coen Brothers actually did a show, I do agree that this would be kind of, like, I wouldn't be surprised if their name was attached to this at all. Um, this episode takes place um, right basically here, the starting point, <clears throat> where we see him jump off the building uh, to get the gun that he needs he needs the address of the guy who has a gun this is what he's willing to do just to get the address and it shows how hard it is to get a gun in certain areas of europe and I, I think that's a really nice and interesting detail about this is how they go about doing things in this show speaking of which i also really like the whole thing with him in the box and the other guy who calls himself spike um the the better explanation of the jellyfish problem because i didn't know the jellyfish regenerate i just didn't know that so i think that's a really cool idea that you know jellyfish you try to kill one it can regenerate and make two and the whole process of you try to solve one problem you make two uh throughout this whole thing uh last season there was a lot about eight you know problems with the a to b uh now we've got like the jellyfish problem and I, I really I enjoy how this show takes these weird little concepts very kind of uh, I don't know it's a thinking show I love that it's a thinking show like um, it's the most unconventional unconventional can I talk uh, spy show I've ever seen and again I just I cannot get you know I can't say enough about how much I love that they use sure shot as the beginning titles and another great uh, title card uh, with all the hands and the fingers and I didn't know what that was gonna mean um, it's it's fun to try to figure out what those what the title cards gonna be about you know like how that's gonna match what happens in the show and this definitely fits <laughs> the fingers are definitely a problem um, <clears throat> another great part of this episode is Kurt Witt Smith's Leslie Claret who again Kurt Witt Smith is just so phenomenal in this part and we get to see, again, him and Terry Quinn uh, face off in a, in a nice way. It's just two great actors that I really, really like. Anytime that they have, you know, a shared uh, screen time, it's just fucking amazing. It's kind of like how people were freaking out when uh, Al Pacino and Robert De Niro had, you know, screen time and heat. You know, these two good actors that finally, you know, have never worked together. And I feel like that's kind of the same kind of comparison of just getting these two guys together is always just an amazing treat to watch. And with different results this time, because the first time they had this conversation at the camp in season one, um, it did not go well because they weren't being transparent. They weren't giving... Leslie the information that he needed and at this point now with things being so dire um, and so close to just completely falling apart it's finally time to let Leslie be a part of what's going on um, and that's how things change and how it all kind of goes back to Leslie's life that Leslie's you know put his is has messed up his son's relationship with him and how uh, John's father is expressing to Leslie that, that he's done the same thing to his son with, and, you know, by telling him about being an intelligence officer. Everything that's happening is not John's fault, it's his. And I love that he's taking responsibility for it. And with Leslie being this kind of proud person, even though he is all about the cocaine now again, which <laughs> is great, um, you know, even up to explaining why he picked the hotel so he could score coke. Um, but now that they know, he knows that they're basically on common ground, Leslie is able to, you know, try to give John a real chance because of the same situation with his son being like estranged from him. 
Uh, meanwhile, we have uh, the three fucketeers, as he calls it, Michael Chernus' character, Ed, um, where Dennis uh, Birdbath and himself are <laughs> discussing the uh, different ways that they've failed John. And then uh, how we, we, they, they decide to stick together to try to help John because he needs real help. Uh, meanwhile, uh, John's wife finally brings back uh, Agatha's daughter back to her, but then immediately she gives her back to uh, John's wife. Uh, I, I don't know, like collateral for <laughs> is she is she using her daughter as collateral, or uh, you know, I don't know. She's supposed to take her to Disneyland though. I don't know really know what Agatha's plan is here, um, but. Again, we have another great folk song from John, uh, planning the robbery of the gun, uh, the gun owner, and how it's just he wants it to be easy, and you know it's not going to go down that way. But again, but it's such a great one shot. I, it feels like it was all done in one take. It really, really does, and it's really impressive. And I know that a lot of people are doing it these days, but to varying degrees of success, this one looks like there's no cuts, man. I I love it. Um, and just the fact that you don't know that Ed and Birdbath and Dennis are all going to be in the convenience store to help. And it just goes right to shit. I mean, as soon as you know, as soon as he walks in and he goes behind the counter, I was like, the guy's got the gun on him. Because you want it to go easy, it's just not. And how, just how fast I was like, oh my God, I think everybody got shot. <laughs> I was like, how are they just all walking out of there? Birdbath does get to use his uh, sack full of uh, dimes to knock out the owner. And I was like, it, like, like in the scene in Reservoir Dogs at the end, when everybody gets shot, it's like that. Like he's like, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and everybody, but everybody walks out of there. Um, except I noticed the finger thing. I was like, I think people are missing fingers here. And I, the song continues as they get onto the train, and I, I just love it. It is so cool. Um, again, that's the, one of the best ways I can put this. This show is just cool, and nobody's watching it. And so for those of you, and I really appreciate the, uh, the comments I've been getting, that people are, a few people are finding this show and are appreciating it and, and are trying to share it with other people. While I like that, part of me, part of me, is just is just enjoying that there's this small group of people out there right now right now that are, that know if you know about this show and you watch this show and you like this show I feel it says something about you and I, 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 you guys are cool I, I just feel like this is just one of those little hidden gems that for right now I'm kind of happy to keep to myself and the few other people that watch it uh, so anyway to get back on track. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so they're all on the train, missing fingers. Dennis is freaking out. And I love the whole, let's find a disgraced veterinarian. Because again, of course, Ed is just obsessed with pop culture and movies. And if it's done in the movies, then we can do it. Uh, that logic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's not going to get you too far. Um, so John, uh, you know, they all decide to separate once the cops know that they're probably, there's somebody on this train that's probably a part of that robbery. And what we don't know is that this is also the same train that John and Le uh, John's dad and Leslie are on. And this is where Leslie and John get to kind of have it out quietly. Explain, John explains his, himself to Leslie. And I love in this scene how how bad John was at explaining McLaren's pipe business work, uh, how other people just rattle off their like nonsense, because it's just what it sounds like. If, you, if you're not familiar with the pipe world, everything that they're saying just sounds like gibberish. But they know what it means, and John can never pull that off. But when he's explaining in his intelligence work to Leslie, who is a very technical person, and explains the intelligence work in ways that a very experienced intelligence officer might explain things, kind of like, you know, instructions in a manual that aren't very clear to you, but if you wrote them down, you understand exactly what's going on in, the, on that, in those instructions. And I think Leslie appreciates that, that understanding of his own job, 
and he can explain it to Leslie as Leslie would want to hear it in a very technical way instead of a very dumbed down way, which is just, I'm an intelligence officer and I'm trying to save the fucking world. <laughs> so, uh, and then when the cop comes to uh, and follow the little blood trail and it's a blood drop, uh, a drop of blood falls on the ground right in front of the cop, in front of John, who is looking very guilty. <laughs> um, they all blame it on Leslie's bloody nose. Which, again, then Kurtwood Smith's Leslie just turns and he's like, you know, I really, like, let it rip this week. And I loved it. He's, like, just telling the cop, basically, hey, man, I'd like to party. And I've been partying pretty hard. And so, and well, he goes, you know. <laughs> and so the, the cops, you know, realize, thinks that uh, the, the blood trail is from a bloody nose of Leslie's. And, um... Finally, you know, it, they, they shake. They have to do it lefty because John's missing fingers. And John and his dad go to get the gun, the finger back from the convenience store. Uh, and I love how the tables are turned here. That uh, John's dad is the, un, you know, the uncomfortable one. Uh, he's in John's world now. Um, eh. It got dark. Whatever, I'm almost done. So I love the look on the smile on John's face as he realizes that now his dad feels so you know what it's like to be out there and uncomfortable and doing something you don't want to do. Uh, and again, this is something that you know John feels like is easy, but you know it's not going to go that way because as soon as we, they get to the convenience store, we have the detective in there whose father we we were introduced to her. A, you know, just a little while ago, and John was saying that his father was a tugboat captain and Leslie's dad was a tugboat captain. None of the, you know, like Leslie's dad is true, but there's just this whole motif, this whole theme of tugboat captains in this show, and we find out that the detective's dad actually is a tugboat captain, which is just another weird little coincidence that, that they throw in here that I just love. But anyway, they walk in, the detective's there. John's dad immediately faints, <laughs> passes out, uh, revealing John to them. Uh, so they know he's there, and it ends on this cliffhanger, which I was really upset about. Because I really wanted to see the, the aftermath, which I now... I, I mean, I will as soon as I watch the fourth episode, but damn it, I really wanted to see what ne what's next. And uh, that's, that's it. So anyway, Guns of, the, uh, of Paris... And the missing fingers that go along with it. Another solid, solid, solid episode. Just great. And uh, I'm sorry that it's been so long since I've been able to get some videos up. But i uh, got a lot going on in my life right now. So yeah, that's it. So anyway, if you liked this review, please hit the like button, comment, share, subscribe, all that jazz. Otherwise, this is Rob at Smirking Gun Review saying we'll see you in the next video. And have a great day.